thanks to all of you for joining us today. As Hillary mentioned, we are doing effective contextual planning using the TOD uh, pilot program at our presentation today. I trust you're in the right room. This isn't the usual conference where maybe a few people would get up and leave realizing they're in the wrong session. So that virtual format is uh, good for something, huh? So like every, um, you can move to the next slide, please, Hillary. Thank you. So like every uh, transit project, this session also has a purpose and need. And what we're trying to do today is to help give uh, potential applicants to the TOD pilot program some ideas for how the funds can be used and various types of planning that could be done using the funding and how they can help your transit corridors advance. Um, we also wanted to impart a few lessons that we've learned over several rounds of grant applications about applying um, and some tricks. And why are we doing this session? What's the need? Um, well, in the past, this grant program had been undersubscribed and FTA was not handing out all of the dollars every time. Uh, that has changed over the last couple of rounds because FTA has expanded the eligibility of the projects that can pursue these funds. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but also we wanted to do this session because uh, these, this TOD pilot program funding seems to answer a, a need and a desire to do this type of planning in a lot of different communities. So kind of getting the word out there about the program and how it can be used. Next slide, please. So today we have three esteemed panelists joining us. Um, I will start by introducing myself. I'm the moderator. My name is Adele Hall. I'm a transit planner at SRF Consulting Group in the Twin Cities, where I manage transit planning projects for clients across the country. And I also oversee a team that has written several successful TOD grant applications. I will be joined first by Monica Walk-Smith. Monica is a senior planner at the City of Milwaukee's Department of City Development, where she focuses on neighborhood level planning. Monica has a background in transportation and equity issues, and she managed Milwaukee's TOD planning grant. Their TOD planning grant was used for planning work in two different neighborhoods to address development pressures that are expected as a result of a planned streetcar expansion. Following Monica will be Brooke Thomas. Brooke is a certified professional planner at Indigo and she's dedicated to improving the transit and land use connection. Her team includes colleagues at the City of Indianapolis, as well as at the Indy Metropolitan Planning Organization, and they're using their grant to change the city's land use and development regulations to better enable TOD and, in some cases, require it. Finally, uh, we'll be joined by Marlise Fratinardo. Marlise is a senior project manager at the Chicago Transit Authority in their strategic planning department, where she supports a wide range of planning and capital construction projects. And after each presenter uh, goes through their presentation, we'll have a chance for Q&A. So we'll do a total of three Q&A sessions throughout the presentation. So if you could hold your, pres your questions to the end of each, uh, each presenter, that would be great. Um, one other note about the order of the presentations, we, we put them in sort of a chronology of, of planning work. So Monica will represent more of a conceptual plan, a station area plan type work. Uh, Brooke will talk about Indigo's efforts to um, codify and implement zoning regulations as kind of a next step. And then Merlise will talk about uh, the process of preparing developer RFPs um, in a community setting. So um, that is our program for today. So one thing to consider is why you would apply for a TOD grant. And I think the most intuitive answer is that the type of planning work that is funded by the TOD uh, grants is often the type of work that transit agencies or cities or counties or MPOs or any other invested jurisdiction who is working on to advance a transit project 
probably wants to do anyway. It's, you know, it's planning work that is um, to advance economic development initiatives, to improve accessibility to station areas, to reconsider land use or development form. And these are often um, ingrained or part of transit projects purpose and need statements or community visions, agency goals. Um, another reason that you might consider applying for this grant is that the work, the planning work that can be funded in the TOD pilot program can help a project have a stronger new starts or small starts application. Um, and that especially comes across in the economic development criterion in new starts and small starts applications. Now, I do need to emphasize here that these TOD pilot program grant funds are not for preparation of new starts or small starts grants. So FTA is very clear about that in the their notice of funding availability. And I just wanted to emphasize that here. Um, one thing, and I mentioned this kind of in passing earlier, uh, your transit project does not have to be in the FTA capital investment grant program. So it doesn't need to be a fixed guideway or a core capacity improvement project, or I mean, it doesn't need to be in the CIG grant program, but it does need to be a fixed guideway or a core capacity improvement project. And FTA defines those terms, fixed guideway and core capacity improvement project in their notice of funding availability. And if there are questions about that, we can talk about that later in the q and I'm gonna turn things over to Monica now and she'll do her presentation. Then we'll pause for Q&A. And I know there've been some Q&A that have, or some questions that have popped up in the, um, in the, uh, the box. So we'll get to those after Monica presents. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Adele. Um, again, my name is Monica Walk Smith, and I'm an urban planner at the city of Milwaukee. Um, I was going to provide a little bit of background. Um, the city of Milwaukee, we opened up the first phase of a downtown streetcar network in November of 2018. It's a 2.1 mile long stretch, um, and it used a combination of small start federal funding and local funds as well. Um, but the vision for this streetcar from the very beginning has been to extend it into the neighborhoods, not just to have it as a downtown amenity, to, but to move it um, north, you know, north from downtown and also south. And so those extensions um, in planning out the land use, the development along those extensions was really the main purpose of this study. We really saw this as an opportunity for neighborhood planning around the future extension routes. It was also an opportunity to engage the public sector through different types of partnerships. We involved a few different business improvement districts, for example. Um, we also wanted to build enthusiasm for future streetcar extension. As you know, it had been a, it, the downtown streetcar network had been fairly controversial, um, and there was a lot of people. Um, especially in the neighborhoods that were a little wary of a streetcar coming. So we wanted this um, to be an opportunity to, to educate and hopefully build some enthusiasm um, by addressing concerns about displacement. A lot of the controversy um, and just kind of trepidation was a fear that a streetcar would change the neighborhood and bring about gentrification and displacement. And then lastly, um, as Adele alluded, um, we also wanted to improve our chances of getting a future small starts grant. So um, when we did this study, I know most everyone in this um, in this webinar understands what transit oriented development is, but this a lot of it, um, sometimes it's hard to explain to the public as we learned, but at the core of it, it's really just neighborhood planning. We're looking at development, the public realm, streetscaping, how to provide those bicycle and pedestrian connections to the, the stations and just planning for that type of connectivity within the system. We call this, this is our, we call it an equitable um, TOD study. And, you know, equity was a very important part of the study from the, the very beginning. Um, we, you know, the extensions were planned in vibrant neighborhoods that are traditionally um, black and Latino areas. 
part of the suspicion resistance to the streetcar was um, that it might spur displacement, as I mentioned. So um, throughout the study, we we're making sure that we we're checking in with people. I'll talk a little bit at, about, at the end about um, an anti-displacement study that we kind of layered on top of this study so that we knew that we could address people's concerns about those really you know, important issues that I'm sure many people um, you know, in the, from cities um, are, are experiencing. Here's a map of the, the final, you know, the final system that we, that we envision. You can see here in the downtown area that I'm circling here, you know, what's been built right now is in the downtown area and goes into the third ward, which is kind of the artsy warehouse district. The, um, the north, northern leg that we hope to, to build in the future goes um, north past the we call the arena district. This is the new Bucks Arena, going north along Martin Luther King Drive here. Um, and then in the southern portion of the, the extension that's planned, it goes south into a neighborhood called Walker's Point area. Um, Walker's Point has a really interesting mix of um, industrial, like warehouses, that's kind of transitioning to more of a um, larger apartment complexes. It's a traditionally Latino neighborhood. Um, there's also small single family homes. So it's a really interesting, interesting mix. And I should say while the, the northern extension here, that route is pretty fixed. In the, the south, we are still looking at a couple of different alignments. So we are pretty early on in the process. There have been some thoughts of going along First Street here or potentially along Second Street. Uh, public engagement um, was a huge part of this study. We had, um, as you can see, there's two very different neighborhoods that are not adjacent to each other. So it almost functioned like two different neighborhood plans. But we had 10 different community workshops. There was um, advisory group committee. We went to, we tabled at different neighborhood events. We had a couple of dinners with community residents. We had an online survey. Um, business luncheons. We also convened um, artists in the Brownsville neighborhood, which is on the in the northern extension area. Um, and in total, we reached you know, over 1,800 people um, as we tracked that. Here are a couple of examples of having meetings. We had a we had a trolley tour of the neighborhood. We had dinners um, just to show the variety of. Um, the variety of outreach that we did. We partnered with a couple local um, community-based organizations to really help drive turnout. And I thought that was really effective. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Southern Extension first um, in Walker's Point. Um, as you can see from the, the map, one of the, you know, the main purposes was to identify where we have that um, extra development potential. One unique aspect, um, trying to measure the development potential is important. Um, Wisconsin has some quirks in that um, our, for the local match, we primarily use TIF funding. There's a lot of uh, downsides to that, but it's one of the few tools that um, we have at our disposal. We're kind of hamstrung by our state legislature and how we can um, raise funds. But looking at some of the different um, nodes where this, we identified where the stations would be. We looked at sites that were gonna be primarily, um, you know, that we expected to see development because they're vacant or up for sale. We looked at some kind of other um, sites that were more, we call them secondary sites um, and estimated that, you know, there was the, you know, likely potential for, you know, 15 to two, 1,500 to 2,000 new homes, 10 to 20 new storefronts, all um, culminating in like three to 4,000 new jobs. Um, and this is, you know, very important to, for us to try to show those benefits and the, the, um, the tax base that it can generate. The next step was to take, take that information and plan out you know, what the land use, the scale, the density would look like. And this is a you know, 3D aerial that shows 
you know, some of the, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of the height, how it's clustered around the existing, the existing, um, you know, the station locations. Um, and this really helped, we took this out to the community to, you know, as an initial, like, you know, is this too much, too little? Does this make sense? And I think it was, it was very helpful from that perspective. Another aspect of this um, study was looking at the streetscape. Um, as you'll see, there's um, both of these corridors, both of these extension routes are on streets that are in dire need of improvement. Um, they're really hostile to pedestrians. Um, I mean, they're hostile to even to drivers, to people on bike. It, just, it doesn't work for anyone. And we wanted to get out ahead of some of the engineering to really think big about what this street could look like. Um, you know, on the south end on the first street, it's only 75 feet wide. Um, we looked at both, um, as I said, we're pretty early on in the planning process. So we weren't even sure if we were looking at a, um, a route that was a loop from 1st Street to 2nd Street, you know, going south on 1st Street, north on 2nd Street, or if it was going to be um, a loop, you know, just, you know, back and forth on 1st Street. So we looked at a couple of different options, but I'm going to show the one that shows the 1st Street, you know, with, um, you know, tracks on both sides of the street. This is the ex existing condition here. That's your, we're looking north into downtown. As you can see, again, no green space, nothing. It's pretty, it's pretty, um, pretty ugly. Um, showing what the public investment would look like. Fixing the street, having a streetcar in, fixing the street, adding bike amenities, adding a terrace, putting, you know, looking at the um, better, better lighting, the bubbler station, that's what we call our um, shared bike system. Um, and then the development that we saw following from that. Um, our lead consultant for this project was um, Skidmore, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, um, and they helped create these uh, renderings. And it was really, these type of renderings are something we absolutely cannot do in-house. And they really helped us communicate the idea um, as we were going out to the public. We also looked at um, Second Street, which is the street immediately to the west. It's a little, um, very much a different character, but we looked into, um, I'll show here's what it is now. This is actually looking, this is looking north again. Um, as you can see, kind of not as auto oriented, it's already very kind of neighborhood, kind of a neighborhood street. Looking at if the streetcar were to go down here one way, adding in that green terrace, um, plantings, bicycle lanes, um, and the development that in infill that may occur as a result of that. As you can see, we, you know, this is much you know, much lower scale of development. We really wanted to make sure that we were being respectful of the um, of the existing neighborhood character. We didn't, you know, we knew that um, is probably unrealistic and not palatable um, to, and you know, to push anything that was um, too, um, you know, too tall, too big. We also looked um, as part of this study, looking at improving bicycle and pedestrian connections to the station areas. So it's how to get to those station areas, not just the station areas themselves, but the whole network. Um, this is Washington Street. It's a east-west street that connects with both Second Street and First Street. Yeah. And just showing, you know, just people on bikes, you know, if you put in, you know, your sharrows, some signage just these small improvements that make a di big difference in people's daily lives. With that, I'm going to go to our, go to our second um, area. I'll go, so there are a lot of the same materials, so I'll go through it fairly, fairly quickly. Um, again, we were looking at the, um, where those main sites are, those primary sites that we expected development. Here at North and King Drive is a big, is an area that there's a lot of 
potential, a lot of momentum right now. Same with the southern end, right around um, where the New Bucks Arena is. And again, estimated that there's potential for 1,500 to 2,000 new homes, um, new units, you know, 20 to 30 new storefronts, um, and, um, you know, 15 to 2,500 new jobs, and also community facilities. There's a museum looking to, to, um, to go in there. Again, showing the, the scale of development, uh, kind of concentrating it. This is the southern end. The, the uh, map is backwards. But looking at the southern end, close to downtown, showing that, you know, the higher density, that's more appropriate, closer to downtown. And then at North Avenue, which is, a key, is already an important bus transfer site. We looked at the streetscaping for this as well. And I'll just, so you can see what the existing condition. It's two lanes in each direction. No, well, there's a tree line on, on one side of the street. Very difficult to even get out of your car. There's a parking lane that, as you can see, is not well used. Um, Showing what the public investment could look like with the, the benches to sit, some greenery, you know, banners, um, and then the kind of development that we'd, that we might, uh, you know, promote, you know, in terms of what the, um, the scale um, that we feel is appropriate. This is another, this is Brown Street. Um, so this shows um, one of the east-west connections and how we um, propose uh, improving, improving that, um, that, that connection. Again, some very minor tweaks, you know, with Sharrows, um, some signage that just makes, makes it a little more friendly. And then in terms of implementation, um, we, part of this study did look at the zoning code, um, which was so helpful to have a pair of fresh eyes to look at our, to look at our zoning code. So we were able to create um, a transit-oriented development, some specific districts that you know, provide that type of density that's more appropriate in a transit-oriented area. Um, you know, we look, it kind of builds on our existing zoning code, but it, it takes out some of those super auto-oriented auto uses. Um, and you know, has some more design features, so higher. Um, urban design standards. And then lastly, I just want to touch on the anti-displacement study. This was actually done a little bit separately, but it was done concurrently with our study. And it was so important. I'm so glad that we were able to do this alongside of it um, because as I mentioned, gentrification and potential displacement were major concerns. A lot of residents had seen their property values increase quite a bit in recent years. Um, so we were able to develop a plan that was able, in the end, was able to garner um, support from a local philanthropy to kick in money um, to help offset um, increases to um, residents um, to their property taxes, given certain criteria such as age and income primarily within certain areas. So this part has already been implemented. And I think knowing that this is in place will really help um, as we move forward, trying to you know, raise the funding and the support for, um, for these streetcar extensions. So, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to see if anyone has any questions. There were several questions that came in during your presentation, Monica, and maybe I'll just start with the logistical one uh, there were several questions about whether the presentations would be available and if the session was going to be recorded and if the recording would be available and the answer to all of those is yes and hillary will from revolution will post in the chat the link to the recording and the materials uh, presentations are available and there are also some other supporting documents uh, that are available on revolution's website related to these presentations so now to the topical questions. Uh, a first question was about the policies and programs that you created or recommended as part of the anti-displacement effort. If you want to get into any more detail than you just noted here. Oh, like um, is the question, what sort of, um, what sort of programs and policies we enacted based on that? Yes. 
Yeah, so I think, you know, the zone and code, that's something that we're in the process of doing. We haven't yet updated our zone and code, but yes, we will be, we will be updating our zone and code. And again, a lot of this is just, is just good planning and this grant enabled us to do that, you know, to be able to dust off our zone and code and make sure that it was supportive of transit oriented development. Um, in some cases, there's things that contradicted that kind of, you know, the development you want to see in those neighborhoods. Um, so that's one thing. And I think the, the anti-displacement study was a program that, um, that we were able to get off the ground a lot quicker than I thought, but it ended up having um, a lot of um, support from the elected officials. So, so that was very important. So those are the two main um, programs and policies that have come out for there. I think another benefit, you know, some of the, you know, the images and the long, you know, some of the more neighborhood plannery long-term type things that I showed have been useful for us. For example, when proposals are coming in, um, we can, you know, take, you know, you use that planning and say, well, this isn't, you know, this either help support trans-oriented development or it doesn't. You know, for example, on one of those major intersections that I showed, like along First Street where it's vacant now, you know, we got a proposal for, you know, one story gas station. And that's, you know, I think we're able to go back to the plan and say, look, you know, we see a streetcar going down here. That's not um you know, that's not something that we're going to support. So it gives us that extra backing to really hold a line on development. And Monica, do you have uh, the published displacement study findings? Or is that uh, a document that's available on the city's website or we can make available on Real Evolution's website? Yes, absolutely. Great, okay, we'll make a note to do that. Uh, we've got another question here. Did you use the TOD grant funding to incentivize meeting attendance, such as food and drink, meeting amenities, or other assistance like daycare or direct individual payments? Yeah, so for this study, that's, that's a great question. Um, for this study, we did provide um, a lot more. So we worked with um, two community-based organizations. We had, you know, we had a large consultant team and we had some sub-consultants that were specifically tasked with um, public engagement. Um, but in addition to that, we partnered with two business improvement districts, one on the north side, one on the south side, and two community-based organizations. And they, um, to the credit, really pushed us on that. They, you know, there's some things that we hadn't done in the past. For example, we had never provided dinner or food at meetings. We had provided maybe snacks, but nothing larger than that. And, you know, what we heard from our community partners was, hey, you can't expect people to show up at a six o'clock meeting and not provide people something to eat. You know, they're giving up their time, something to do. Um, you need to take, you know, you need to provide, you know, some sort of um, food. So we did that for every meeting. Um, we did have, um, we did do a raffle at one of our meetings as well. Um, and that's something where, you know, our city policies and procedures um, maybe haven't kept up with best practices um, with the money that we provided to our community partners. Um, they provided some of the, the, the raffles, but um, the city would not allow me directly to um, purchase any any items for the raffle. Anyway, that's a little bit of a workaround, but I think the takeaway there is that that, that kind of, um, you know, doing a raffle, um, providing food are, really do help drive attendance um, for that. And we didn't get any um, I'm trying to, I, I think that funding may, may have come through our match. Yeah, I'm forgetting off the top of my head whether that money, um, probably someone from FTA can answer that question, whether we used FTA funding to provide those, um, those, um, those items or if we may have used um, our, um, our share, the, the, the city's share for that. But um, I think doing whatever you can for that is very important. Um, we did not do any direct payments. That question has come up. We haven't yet done that. I'd be interested if others have tried that or found a way to make that work or daycare for that matter. But no, we did not do that, those things. 
Yeah, we've had now several questions come in about the anti-displacement plan. Um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to elaborate just a little bit more on that work. And, um, and then there's also a, a short question here uh, about the total budget for the project and how much funding was provided from the TOD pilot program. I think those will have to be our last two questions. There were a lot of questions for you, Monica. Um, and uh, at the end, maybe we'll have time to come back to some of these, but we'll need to move on after these two. Sure. So the quick question about the, the dollar amount, um, we got a total of $750,000. We used $250,000 for a market analysis that was kind of like um, phase one. And then we had half a million dollars for the, for the planning work. Um, and then the anti-displacement study, it, it was a part of it, like we started off with uh, just um, a lot of data analysis to understand the conditions and looking at, you know, um, what you, looking at how the property values had, you know, both looking at how property values had increased over time or not increased, and then also looking at who had moved into the neighborhood over a space of time, you know, was it becoming, were uh, people of color moving out and white um, populations moving in, or was there just depopulation in general? Um, so we kind of narrowed it down to that and then identified specific census tracts that were affected. And then from there, we developed, you know, some different policy recommendations and we, were, we ended up being able to create a, a small fund um, that we have funding for at least the next five years um, to help offset property increases. So I can share, absolutely share that um, document and put that online because, yeah, that's... Um, probably more, more time than we have right now, but I'd be happy to, um, you know, anyone can contact me with my, with, at my email too, if they have questions. Thanks, Monica. And we'll provide all the email and contact information for everyone at the end of the session. I think it is time for us to move on to Brooke Thomas's presentation. Thanks, Adele. Hi everybody, um, again, my name is Brooke Thomas. I'm the Director of Strategic Planning here at Indigo. Uh, Indigo is the bus operator for the consolidated city of Indianapolis, Marion County. We're a municipal corporation, um, which is largely separate um, from the city of Indianapolis. And um, that distinction, uh, that nuance can be important from time to time. We're making a significant investment in our public transit system, the type of capital investments that can have a tremendous impact on Indy's community and economic development potential. Uh, we are using Small Starts funding to do that. Uh, this grant project is complementary to that, although we are using the Blue Line BRT corridor as kind of our case study. Uh, we are hoping to protect our medium high um, scoring for that corridor. Uh, maybe we can even enhance it. Um, unfortunately, um, as Adele had mentioned at the top, uh, Indianapolis's development code doesn't allow for property owners or developers or staff or local elected and appointed officials to make the most of the land that's near our transit stations. There are certain aspects of the ordinance that are just more complex than they need to be. Um, the zoning regulations actually prevent some of the types of development that the neighborhoods have said that they want to see. And the ordinance doesn't adequately accommodate for housings at you know, price points that people can afford. Uh, we saw this grant as an opportunity to address these facts. We are currently operating at this intersection of equitable growth and what we often think of when we think of community, community and economic development. We wanna increase the number of people within a five minute walk of a high frequency bus route by 180%. So in numbers, that's going from 40,000 residents to about 200,000 residents. We wanna triple frequent transit access for households in poverty, older adults, persons with disabilities, and we also think that we can reach 10,000 more families who don't own a car of their own. 
Um, we also want to increase the number of jobs near frequent rapid transit routes by 50%. So again, you know, more than 500,000. Ultimately, Indianapolis, uh, like many places, right, we need more tools to protect affordability and the culture or the heritage of um, our communities. This case study or this example is one of physical mobility, economic mobility, and social mobility. Um, if you're born, born poor in Indianapolis, chances are um, you will die poor in Indianapolis. So who is we? I say we a lot. Um, welcome to Indianapolis. If this was a bus tour, we would be driving past high rises and working farms and everything in between. Indianapolis is largely built out, uh, arguably under demolished. We've got affordable housing, but many of our households are transportation cost burden. Indianapolis became a consolidated city county government in 1970, and that was to save our city center. We leveraged the growth of the first and second ring suburbs to save our downtown. And by most accounts or all accounts, we were wildly successful at doing that. But we've underspent on transit. Um, when we started down the path of creating the Marion County Transit Plan, which we're in the process of implementing, you know, we were 14th largest city in the US, 86th in transit supply per capita, and the third most expensive transportation market. Um, all is not lost. Um, there's been momentum for this type of change, the type of change that we're actually all describing today that's been building for decades. And it's manifested itself in terms of adopted policies and plans and you know, grant projects like this one. Um, we are using FTA, TOD, pilot program grant dollars to advance local goals to, for land use change, redevelopment, multimodalism, and placemaking around transit. We want to improve the regulatory environment and set the stage for good station area development um, like my colleagues are talking about today. Our definition of success for this grant is real simple. We are either successful at amending the local land use and development regulations or we're not. I mentioned that we, Indigo, are making considerable investments in the city's public infrastructure. The Mary County Transit Plan, specifically the three new BRT lines, is as much a public transportation project as it is a transit project. There are lots of safety improvements for motorists and pedestrians and cyclists and emergency responders in all of this work. There's just 34 transit platforms um, for the red line, but there's more than 30,000 linear feet of sidewalk replacements, more than 26,000 linear feet of storm sewer that's being replaced, nearly 7,000 linear feet of new bike lanes, um, nearly 600 upgraded ADA curb ramps, 30 new trees, right, and 37 new bike racks. Um, there's something in it for everybody. The time to address the land use and transportation connection is now, and in fact, in some cases, it's already a little too late. Uh, very few people understand the opportunity that is before us, and even fewer people know how to engage in this conversation. So we've been trying um, to educate um, as much as we possibly can. The bad stuff is allowed absolutely everywhere. Um, this is a brand new gas station adjacent to a future Blue Line BRT station. Um, you can maybe see the gentleman in the lower right hand corner. He was painting the dumpster enclosure. This wasn't even open when I took this picture. Um, the good stuff is really tough to get approved. Um, we have a lot of demand and very little opportunity. Remember, Marion County is a square. Um, this is that. Um, research conducted by the Indianapolis MPO and MIBOR Realtor Association has shown that there is a lot of demand for walkable 15 minute um, neighborhoods here in Indy and city planners have also been able to demonstrate just how very little land there is for that uh, near transit specifically. Um, our current inventory of walkable places is about five square miles out of all 403. Uh, that's just about 1.3% of the county and that is comprised of downtown and then our streetcar suburbs. 
Um, but it seems like we kind of lose ground in these areas um, a little bit every day. We can and often do quantify our transit investment, um, whether we're talking about higher frequencies or longer operating hours, easier transfers. Um, thanks in large part to this project, uh, we now have a stated value proposition. And it's simply this, that we should be using our local planning and zoning authority to ensure that we get a return on the public's transit investment. Um, we should be protecting and, and where possible increasing the assessed valuation of the land that it serves. Hey, Brooke, uh, this is our I blue line. For a moment? Yep. Sorry, you've got a, a pop up in front of the presentation. Oh, I'm so we sorry. Can... That's okay. Carry on. Okay. Um, this is our blue line BRT corridor. If uh, I were Joe Minicozzi, he's the principal of Urban 3 that did this work, I would say guess where downtown Indianapolis is and you would be right to say it's the big purple spikes. So this is the same corridor, um, but with this bar graph. Um, the opportunity, we're looking at where opportunity is. The green stuff is the good stuff. It's civic uses, things that are over one story tall, limited parking, um, all the way at the other end is vacant land. Then it's followed by land that's upside down, meaning that the land is more valuable than the building that's on top of it. We think the opportunity to transform, you know, use zoning and land use regulations to transform the corridor is somewhere in that blue area um, where, you know, one story buildings, maybe even where that yellow line lives. We are often asked to quantify the economic lift of our catalytic public investment projects. Um, if you do know Indianapolis, you know that we're considered the amateur sports capital of the world. So it often helps to use sports analogies. The COVID pandemic has made us painfully aware of just how important sports, entertainment, tourism, and conventions are to our local economy. And this is yet another reason why we think more people should care about protecting or preserving what is ultimately less than 2% of Indianapolis's land area. The technical solution. Um, this diagram, um, we mapped out what our approach to changing the zoning could be. Um, of course, there are some changes that are effective, more effective than others, and there are some that are easier to do than others. Where we landed was within this blue bubble. Um, we have both strategic text amendments and a protective TOD overlay district. For the strategic text amendments, we want to simplify and refine the development standards kind of throughout the residential zoning districts and then our mixed use zoning districts specifically to improve connectivity and walkability, design at the human scale, and return lot and yard standards to support historic building patterns. We want to reintroduce even more of those missing middle building types and avoid regulating for design or taste. Um, the protective overlay district, um, it creates a narrowly defined area. We're just looking at a thousand feet around the BRT corridors. Um, it restricts non-contributing land uses through design standards um, and promotes TOD best practices, again, without being too prescriptive. Here are all the buzzwords um, for planners on one slide. Uh, the most important thing you could know about the text amendments is that they are only as complicated as they need to be. When it comes to our BRT station areas and frequent transit stops, what we are primarily concerned with is the size and scale and form that a development takes. When Monica was sharing um, their public outreach and engagement, she talked about going to the community and asking them, is this too much? Is this too little? This is exactly what um, I mean when I say size, scale, and form. We're also playing the long game. Um, we recognize that change happens incremental, incrementally over a long period of time. There are no shortage of first and second ring, you know, second generation shopping malls that stand to be redeveloped. But what we wanna be sure to enable is the type of infill development that can restore or create that sense of place. 
this is just one of the typologies that was developed by the Gould Evans team to illustrate to the community that we were talking to that we're not talking about massive developments or redevelopment projects or high rise buildings. Uh, what we want to be sure to enable is two story buildings instead of one story building and then no parking spaces as opposed to parking lots, but that's the primary use of the land. Um, for us, um, this was much more than a pilot project. Codifying Indy's TOD strategy was and is the single biggest step that we can take to protecting and enhancing the public's investment in transit. Um, it's why our RFP, uh, is centered around storytelling as opposed to code writing. There's a lot of code writers out there, but what we needed to do was to tell our story. Um, I would encourage you, whether you take a zoning approach or a planning approach, um, know your why and never stop repeating it. Thanks so much, Brooke. I'm looking through, I don't think we have any written questions um, in the Q&A function right now. Um, do we have any other questions that folks want to answer? If so, please. Oh, we just had one come in. What is the definition of a household that has a car but is overly burdened financially by owning that car? probably transportation cost burden. <laughs> it's the how, you know, especially when you consider how much they pay in housing. Um, if they have to own that car, could it go towards housing instead or healthcare or food? Yeah, we had one question come in earlier that I think could be asked of any of our, our panelists, which was, uh, what would you do differently if you received another TOD grant? That's a good question. We're not all the way through, so it seems impossible um, to think um, in reverse. Um, I think we would have probably probably been talking to um, elected and appointed officials the entire time instead of um, queuing it up uh, towards the adoption process. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is kind of related. How was the working relationship between the three agencies? Uh, couldn't have done it without them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, since neither the Indianapolis MPO or Indigo have any kind of regulatory authority, land use authority. Um, the city, city planning staff, our Department of Metropolitan Development, they are the ones that have to know it inside and out and be able to explain it and, um, and not, necessarily, not necessarily defend it, but know it inside and out, right? And so all we can do at this point is support them, um, but the development of all of it was, you know, all of us. Absolutely. So um, it looks like the original submitter of the question about the household with a car and being cost burden has clarified and is wondering if you could, if you know, what is the formula that determines which households are burdened by car ownership? And is that a oh. formally defined? Term. It is, and I would mess it up um, to say it, but it's similar to um, housing cost burden. If it, if more than I think it's thirty five percent of your uh, take home uh, income goes towards housing, then you're considered housing cost burden. There's a similar percentage, and I want to say it's around forty percent. Um, there's probably somebody that can write in the chat and knows exactly what it is, um, but it's somewhere around forty percent. If forty percent. The combined, if if combined, if more than forty five percent of your housing and transportation costs, or more of your income goes to housing and transportation, then your housing and transportation costs burden. Okay, so we've got all of a sudden a few more questions popping in. Um, I will 
have to pick just one of these um, so that we can move on. But we will uh, hopefully have some time at the end for some additional questions to be addressed. Um, someone asked, was there a feasibility analysis that helped to confirm the extent to which the issue was actually zoning constraints or mostly market constraints? Sometimes much more is allowed than a developer is willing to build. Is that the case here? So there wasn't a market analysis per se, but we did have the support of um, Urban Land Institute. Uh, they looked at parking. Uh, we wanted to know and we asked them and, and they did the research and I'll be happy to share this. Um, if we were to remove all of the parking minimums across all of Marion County, um, which is never gonna happen, but <laughs> Would the, would the development community just put it back? Would lenders require it um, and, and just put it back for commercial developments? Um, so spoiler alert, um, the answer is no, that it's not lenders that are, that are putting it back. Um, so that's probably as close as we got to um, a market analysis. We've, we've known for a while that um, we've needed to update our zoning ordinance. Um, it was last updated, um, a big, the big, last big overhaul was Indy Rezone um, just, you know, five or six years ago. Um, and it took a big leap in that direction. So we're just topping it off. Got it. Thanks so much, Brooke. Mm -hmm. All right, I think it's time for us to transition over to Marlies and start her presentation. It's all yours, Marlies. All right. Thanks, Adele. And hello, everyone. My name is Marlies Fratinardo, and I'm a project manager in, strate in CTA's strategic planning department. And thanks, everyone who's on the line here. It's, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about the work that we did. Um, CTA used our grant funding to develop a comprehensive TOD plan for phase one of the red and purple modernization program. The TOD plan provided a, um, and the whole the effort um, really provided a realistic and desirable vision for development on vacant parcels following the completion of the RPM phase one construction. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you have to bear with me, there's a lot of acronyms here, um, but this slide discusses uh, some of the background about RPM phase one. So RPM is a transformative multi-phase project that's designed to ensure a strong future for the CTA's red line, which is the system's main line that extends for over 21 miles from the city's northern border at Howard to its southern terminal at 95th Dan Ryan Station. And you can see it here um, on this map along the lakefront, it's the, the long red line. Um, so, um, in addition to serving the north and south sides of Chicago, the red line infrastructure also provides service beyond the city's northern border, known as the Purple Line, to the suburban communities of Evanston and Wilmette. The system improvements under RPM are being completed in phases, which allows CTA to make the greatest number of improvements while minimizing impacts on riders and to the surrounding communities. The RPM phase one project is a $2.1 billion effort, and it will completely rebuild four rail stations and more than a mile of tracks and support structures on the north side. So RPM phase one has two distinct project areas, and these are the, uh, the acronyms here in the title on this slide. Under the red purple bypass, the RPB project, a new bypass structure will be constructed um, north of the red line um, station at Belmont to modernize a 100-year-old flat junction. And the RPB project will help to meet growing demand for transit service in this part of the city. The project at the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization, the LBMM, will bring four stations in the CTA structure to modern standards in that area. Um, RPM will also increase its rail speeds with the install installation of a new higher capacity signal system, allowing for increased throughput of uh, our trains and improved service reliability. So next slide, please. Uh, both projects under RPM phase one required the acquisition and demolition of properties. 
These are both CTA owned and private parcels we needed to acquire to locate new track structure elements and to stage the phase one construction. CTA is deeply committed to economic development as an important part of any major capital project, um, including, including encouraging the redevelopment of parcels within that project's footprint print upon completion. So CTA's objective here is to return these RPM par parcels to active uses through redevelopment as soon as possible once the RPM phase one construction is complete by soliciting developers through a formal RFP process. So the TOD work um, that we did um, helped lay the groundwork for realistic and desirable vision for development following um, RPM phase one construction. And our plan grew out of CTA's longtime public involvement work in the community and based on the public on which it, um, it was began in 2009. Um, and based on the public feedback that we had received about the importance of redevelopment after RPM phase one was completed, CTA committed to creating this redevelopment plan. Um, so we successfully applied to the FTA pilot program for TOD planning to fund this project, We're very grateful that um, and we engaged a multidisciplinary consultant team led by Solomon Cordwell Benz to develop a TOD plan. And um, it's, we um, call it a TOD plan, but it was um, really it was two separate reports, one each for the RPB and LBMM areas. Uh, next slide. So those two individual plans um, were completed under the grant and I'll be focusing um, today on the LBMM plan to give everyone just an overall sense of the process and the work that we did. Both plans used a very similar methodology and process. So um, LBMM, it covers roughly 157 acres, four red line stations and three aldermanic wards and work under that the um, construction project included renewing those four stations and um, doing our much needed structure updates and accessibility improvements. So since our plan work was um, happening somewhat, uh, you know, in tandem with the, um, some of the engineering work under the RPM phase one construction, we were able to coordinate our efforts um, in regard to the resulting streetscapes after the completion of RPM phase one, um, coordinating on the best possible access to those development sites, and also um, we're able to weigh in on the condition of those redevelopment sites post-construction um, to allow enough room for truly developable parcels. Um, so the LBMM area contains several um, major east-west arterial streets where those CTA stations are located. And um, you know, really this, this um, area was um, grew out of the, the presence of transit, um, which um, had been in this area since um, the very early 1900s. So um, moving on to the next slide. So there's a lot going on on this image. Um, and this slide shows the LBMM project area. So we're looking south here, the northernmost station known as Bryn Mawr um, is, um, at the as, um, kind of at the bottom of the map here, um, looking south. So we have the Bryn Mawr Station, Berwyn, Argyle, and Lawrence moving up um, to the top of the image. And um, this also shows a few larger planned redevelopment projects that aren't or just development projects, not CTAs, are also shown on this image. And you can see that they're quite small, but um, there are in red. Some buildings are highlighted and those are the redevelopment parcels near each station that are targeted for redevelopment. So the TOD plan effort was in, is intended to take some of the guesswork out of what will happen to these parcels in the future and provide a level of comfort to residents who want new development to reflect their community's personality. Next slide. Great. So yeah, speaking of personality, I just wanted to give everyone a chance to uh, take a peek at the neighborhood a little bit. Um, it's very, LBMM area is a culturally, ethnically, and economically diverse community, um, with wide range of development densities, architectural styles. It's a historical neighborhood. 
typified by its 1920s ar architecture, very vibrant, um, local uh, shopping scene. I just saw um, in the chat, someone mentioned they're um, local from Edgewater, so hey. Um, <laughs> So full of entertainment venues, very walkable, and the CT track structure also from the 1920s is a key neighborhood feature. Next slide, please. All right, so getting back to our plan, this slide provides, a, provides an overview of the actual process. And you, um, if I can show you the line at the bottom of the slide shows the RPM phase one project engagement from 2009's initial visioning through the construction completion in 2025. Um, so you can get a better sense from this image of where the TOD plan effort sits within the overall context of the RPM phase one. Um, so there were five steps to the TOD plan work. Um, a discovery phase in which we completed an existing conditions analysis. Um, I won't read everything here, but it just shows um, some of the major de deliverables in this image of what we did. Um, also, the, a lot of that coordination with the RPM phase one construction happened in discovery. Visioning was developing a vision and guiding principles and goals, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, the development and recommendation phases where we um, propose some concepts and recommendations and then the implementation strategies, which will begin um, a few years from now um, in the mid 2020s before the completion of the um, project in 2025. So the plans were completed um, in 2018, and part of the plan development included the preparation of draft RP, RFPs for these sites. These RFPs were developed um, as part of our project work, and they're um, sort of on hold for the moment, um, but they will be activated um, soon to align with the completion of the RPM phase one project. And those RFPs will allow for those the transition of those um, parcels from construction areas to um, redevelopment. Next slide. Next. Um, as I mentioned, CTA has had a very robust public involvement process for the RPM phase one project. The TUD plans continued this public involvement effort through a participatory planning process to propose um, site-specific development options, land use, and zoning recommendations for the available um, parcels. The TOD plans had 12 months of community engagement and a total of six public open house style meetings. And that's the total um, for both of the TOD efforts, one the RPD and LBMM combined. So we did three meetings in each area. So at the first meeting, we was idea gathering. We allowed, um, you know, Kind of an opportunity for residents to learn more about the project, talk with staff, express their vision for the, um, these parcels. The second meeting, we it was more of a confirmation of the vision that we had heard from the community and goals, vetting of some of the additional initial ideas for the parcels, and um, presenting some of the concepts that we developed. And then we had a third meeting that presented final recommendations and next step for implementation. So allowing the um, um, constituents in both communities to review the recommendations that we made during our public process, providing additional comments, and um, just learn about next steps in our effort. We relied um, really heavily upon our, our project partners. Aldermanic dialogue was required throughout under Chicago's aldermanic system, zoning changes, Variances, amendments, um, et cetera, typically require aldermanic review. CTIL also worked very closely with the Chicago Department of Planning and Development, um, who was a formal project partner, keep them apprised of the work. We established and maintained a dedicated TOD plan website. And um, really what we found through this work is that our plan efforts helped transform our community conversation about the phase one project in a really positive way by providing an opportunity for community members to engage in the ultimate outcomes for their neighborhoods. Um, and you know, these are the, the community members who would be most impacted by RPM phase one construction. Let's see, I'm sorry, I'm just taking a look at the chat here. Um, I'll get to those in a bit. 
Um, so um, here is the vision statement that was developed um, out of those community conversations and meetings that we had um, for the LBMM project. The vision was crafted from input received at the first public meeting, later refined by the team, and then it was confirmed by the community at the second public meeting. And what we heard was that the community um, was seeking future redevelopment that is thoughtfully designed, contributes positive, positively to the community, and promotes a transit-rich lifestyle. Uh, next slide. And in addition to that community vision, we also developed guiding principles for future redevelopment. And both of the community vision and these guiding principles were incorporated into the future developer selection criteria and RFP documents that we de developed during this project. Next slide. All right, so um, having a clear vision, principles, and goals for future development in advance of the RPM phase one completion allowed CTA to ex help expedite the developer selection process and redevelopment of the parcels to a productive use following construction. Um, and I just want to mention that the TOD plans were developed within the context of Chicago's TD TOD ordinance um, that allows for new construction around our stations and within a half mile radius be eligible for reductions of parking requirements, height area increases, um, floor area ratio increases, and minimum lot area reduction. Next slide. So the LBMM TOD plan evaluated four sites and so did the RPB TOD plan. And what I'm going to do for the next several slides is just walk through one example of what we did that I hope will be really illustrative. And this is in LBMM and it's at the Argyle station. The site um, that we identified is um, 4,700 square feet. It's adjacent to the CTA's Argyle Station. It's in the West Argyle Historic District. Um, it sits along an existing and very well-established mixed-use corridor. It's comprised primarily of local retailers on the ground floor and residential units on upper floors. Next slide. Um, this one just shows the, the parcel itself and it's um, its proximity to the CTA's Argyle station. And for this site, the team analyzed and recommended a five-story building with ground floor retail and 16 apartments. So, next slide. So here's a um, picture of the streetscape. And the parcel that I'm speaking about is visible um, in this image right to the left of the word Asia. It's a one-story commercial building. It's formerly associated with the 1920s station and has been owned by CTA. So what we heard from the community about this um, station area is that the future should really celebrate the Asia on Argyle brand, grow residential development, and integrate contemporary design elements with respect to the historic context and um, National Register District, and also promote local businesses, small shops, and restaurants. Next slide. So through our TOD um, effort, you can see here that this rendering shows the development proposal um, that could be built here potentially after the project. Um, the RPM phase one construction is complete. So as I mentioned, it's five stories, um, 16 one and two bedroom apartments. And in this case, uh, the current zoning and the proposed zoning was sufficient and would remain the same. In some areas, our, um, the work actually led to a, a recommended um, change in zoning. So a similar analysis was done for all sites that were studied in both of the TOD plans for the, this LBMM area and also the um, RPB area. Next slide. So this image shows the next steps for the plans. So. Um, both plans were um, completed, the planning piece of it, in 2018. And CTA will begin our developer selection for these sites um, in 2022, 2023, to allow for a seamless transition 
for these sites after phase one completion, which is estimated in 2025. Next slide. So in regard to the competitive selection process for these developers through the TOD plan work, CTA will con consider a variety of factors in addition to price. Um, we'll be looking at the developer's ability to deliver the project in a timeline that's desired by the community. And we'll also be looking for developments that create value in the community as documented in the TOD plan. And the draft RFPs um, that we develop um, during our TOD plan effort include evaluation criteria and scoring that align with the community and vision and goals um, statements that I showed earlier. Next slide. So these two plans, of course, are a starting point. Um, the developers will continue to have responsibilities just like any other development in the city. They will have to submit a proposal that meets or exceeds CTA's RFP selection criteria. They will also need to meet all um, city requirements, of course, including applying for permits, um, um, make um, what they need to do for any required zoning relief, and meet um, all the associated public processes that um, such zoning relief would require. In addition, a developer will need to comply with city's affordable housing and sustainable development requirements, as well as regulatory requirements for utilities, zoning, and easements. Um, so it's really, you know, CTA's hope that all the groundwork done um, during our TOD plan effort will help streamline all these future approvals. Next slide, please. All right, so the plans resulted in a framework that capitalizes on the adjacent CTA transit service, reflects the community's division, or um, community's vision, not division, um, in response to market demands. Please check out the RPM TUD project on our website. All of our materials are available there, including the final deliverables. And I adapted the slides in this presentation from the third round of public involvement meetings, um, which are available on the website. And I'm very happy to um, also say that CTA received a second pilot program grant, um, and that project is active right now. And that is a transit supportive development plan for a um, second very large project, um, the Red Line Extension on Chicago's far south side. So yeah, please do check out um, all the work on our website. And there's a link in the um, uh, uh, you know, session for this, um, or the, um, the website for this program. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Marlies. We had several questions come in while you were presenting. And I'll start with the first one we received um, which kind of goes back to the earlier part of your presentation. Uh, could you comment on what the criteria are to identify redevelopment sites and how property owners are engaged in those discussions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sites were a mix of properties that um, CTA had already owned, and then there were some properties that did need to be required. So that was a, um, you know, a, multi-year process um, um, during which time we were coordinating with those owners um, and were able to um, you know make arrangements for CTA to purchase those properties. So those um, all the sites I'm talking about were either in one of those categories properties that we already owned or ones that were um, acquired during our process. And how big are the development opportunities in general in terms of like square footage or acreage? Let's see, um, I don't have the actual square footage numbers here, looking at my notes, but um, many of them were analogous to the Argyle station example that I showed in that they were um, resulted in, um, you know, we had basically there were a couple that were five-story buildings with um, two involved, both 16 apartments. Um, there, our tallest one was an eight-story building, um, and that was 81 apartments. We had one that was a seven-story building with 99 apartments. So they did um, vary quite a bit in size and height. Um, but yeah, let's see. For the most part, 
Um, and then for the RPB TOD plan, those were all between four and six stories and were um, around 35 um, apartments. Okay. That gives a sense of the scale. What would you say were the top pushback issues from the neighborhoods or community members or from the development community? Uh, let's see. Well, I think really from our TOD plan work, that that was an opportunity for people to really come together. I think that, you know, CTA has been involved in a very long-term public involvement process, um, you know, for since 2009. Um, so the community was aware, but obviously it's a major change. It's a mega project in the neighborhood. So I think that, um, you know, just the, the disruption that that would cause, I think there was a lot more concern um, coming from the community about just the intensity of the RPM phase one itself. And um, I feel like our TOD work was really something that helped bring people together um, because it was really provided a, an outlet for people to voice um, Maybe some of their maybe concerns or uh, questions about the large scale of construction that was happening in their community. But I think it also got people really excited about what's possible for some of these sites um, and to have the opportunity to have input in that and really understand that, um, you know, we're really doing our best to, you know, we don't control the ultimate um, developer reality necessarily, but we can really do our best to lay that framework carefully make sure that um, you know that we received a good feedback and that everyone was aligned as much as possible before we embarked on um, those RFPs. So I feel like the effort itself was like that, I think was the greatest thing about it um, was just being at these meetings and having people like just the enthusiasm about it. Um, whereas I think before this work was done, you know, there was just some concern about what does this mean? What is this going to be like? Um, and just having that outlet was really a great thing. Excellent. Thanks so much, Marlies. Uh, we will conclude with a few last tidbits about the grant ap application process from yours truly. Um, Hillary, if you would be willing to share those slides. And we just have a few minutes left. These will go quite quickly. Um, if you are thinking about applying for a grant in the near future, I think hopefully this these next few slides will be useful to you. Hillary, are you able to bring them up? Perfect. Wonderful. So just a few basics. The applicant to the grant program needs to be an FTA grantee. So if your agency has already received grants from, an F from FTA, you're likely an FTA grantee. Um, but you also need a partner who has land use authority. So we've seen in the case of um, Indigo and with CTA, the, the transit authority or the transit agency partnered with the city, um, and that was a, a viable partnership for the grant purposes. In the case of Milwaukee, we saw the city is both a grant re recipient and has land use authority. So um, I think the lesson here, and we can move into the next slide, um, is that um, you you want to be coordinated with your partners and that goes right into the funding piece as well um, here minimum award of 250 maximum award of 2 million uh, maximum federal funding share is 80 percent so that other 20 percent has to come from the local uh, sponsor or applicant but can also come from your local partners and so and it can be cash but um, and cash from a lot of different revenue sources and it'll um, FTA will say in the notice of funding availability where those sources can what those sources can be but they also allow in-kind match which can be really helpful to getting to sort of the level uh, of dollars that you want to to um, receive to be able to do the work you want to do. So um, sometimes uh, when you're putting together these applications, getting the in-kind contributions pulled together from a lot of different local partners can take some time and some coordination. The application window is usually about two months. Um, so this was one of our big lessons learned was just, it's really helpful to have 
the partnerships in place and the relationships established. And Hillary, if you'll go to the next slide, I will offer one last example from the Twin Cities where our counties, as represented by the blue outline here, our counties tend to sort of incubate our transit projects in the Twin Cities. And in this case, the county was very interested in pursuing these TOD grant dollars. Uh, counties uh, have, this county has neither land use jurisdiction nor is it an FTA grantee. So they needed to partner with the transit agency and they partnered with all five of their corridor cities. So they had a total of seven agencies involved in their grant application. It does not always have to be this complex, um, but the reason that they were able to pull this off is because they they had very established relationships and had really developed those um, those partnerships in advance. Uh, so that can be really helpful. And they were able to count local in-kind match from I think four of those seven organizations toward their contribution. Uh, so. That is all that we have today in terms of grant tidbits. I will say, um, if you looked very deep, buried in the Q&A, um, Ken Cervenka was answering some questions. He noted that Congress uh, appropriated 10 million toward the 2021 TOD pilot program, uh, pilot program. So $10 million should be available this year. And he said they're not sure about the timing yet for the notice of funding availability. But it sounds like that's good news. We should see an offering this year. Um, and, and as you're thinking about your agency applying for one of these um, grants, or you're going to work on one of these grants, feel free to reach out to any of us on the panel today. We will happily um, talk, talk with you about anything you heard. And our contact information is here, and our our um, names, of course, are on are on the Revolution website as well. And thanks to you all, we got so many questions, and really, people were so engaged throughout the entire uh, panel or entire presentation. So thank you so much.